Hello folks, it is Tuesday morning and we are back uh, studying concerning who Jesus is and last week and the week before we talked about his priestly ministry and this week we're going to be talking about the atonement so I think that'll be something also that would be very helpful for you so hang around, we're going to welcome a few folks and we'll jump into the word. See some um, folks logging on. Hey, Jana, good to see you this morning. Hey, Sarah, good to see you as always. Hope you're doing well today. It's a nice day out there. Uh, beautiful, feeling like really might be fall. It is it's a lovely morning here in Northwest Alabama. And we pray for the people down around the coast as mm -hmm. the hurricane approaches. We just pray safety and peace and pray that thing would lift and mm -hmm. dissipate in Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. Hey, Tommy, Miss Peggy, Justin, good to see you. Paula. Good to have our friends logging on this morning as we get ready to start a new week, a new topic um, on our Facebook study about who Jesus is, a new part of it. Pastor Gary and Susie, Tracy, good to see all of you this morning. And hope you have your coffee, your Bible, your notes, your notebook, whatever it is. You're ready to dive in. I've got my espresso uh, toned down with almond milk, as usual. Hey, Pastor Doc, Miss June. Hey, Sherry. Good to see you. Don't want to miss any of you. If we can say hello, we'll catch you and we will. We are going to start today in Isaiah. So if you have your Bibles or you have your notes. Hello, Nixon. Bless you. Thank you for joining us today. We've really enjoyed speaking and uh, doing some teaching on who Jesus is, and we're continuing in that vein. Um, no more important subject for Christianity than Christ himself. And uh, we will eventually shift gears, but we've uh, looked at a, a lot of different aspects of Jesus' life. We talked about his pre-incarnate existence, his eternal, we talked about his incarnation, um, and we, the last couple of weeks, we've talked about his apostleship, his role as a mediator, and then we uh, segued into the priestly ministry of Jesus. He is our high priest after the order of Melchizedek. We saw that mm -hmm. over and over and again mm -hmm. last week. And today we're gonna uh, we're gonna shift gears a little bit and talk about the atonement. Again, that's a theological term, and mm -hmm. sometimes people think, well, what in the world has that got to do with anything? Well. Uh, what we're doing, we're kind of popping the hood and taking a deeper look at mm -hmm. what Jesus did on the cross. And that is central to Christianity, you know, in simple terms, the cross, the vertical part of the cross, bringing God and man together and the horizontal part has to do with enabling us to, to reach out and touch the world with the love of God. And so uh, the atonement has to do with what was happening as Jesus died on the cross. Behind the scenes, theologically, as far as uh, explanation, reason, what was God up to? What was the devil up to? What was Jesus up to? What was man up to? There's so many tangent points that we could, we could touch on concerning uh, Jesus' death on the cross. And so we're gonna be talking about the atonement and um, you know that's where our redemption took place when Jesus died an atoning death on the cross and he was qualified to be the one who would be our redeemer uh, who would provide atonement for us and uh, some of those qualifications are important too they are first thing we we'll, just for in matter of review we talked about this that he was a real man he was a voluntary man. He did what he did voluntarily. He was representative and he was sinless and he was the God man. And so those are kind of uh, foundational to the discussion we'll have today. And there's no doubt about it that um, Adam's original state in creation 
was one thing. What happened after Adam and Eve sinned, it changed their state of being. And God uh, had, knowing all this ahead of time, he, he had a plan. And that was to restore man back to his pre-fallen condition. And when Paul, in writing in the New Testament, he, you know, he goes back to Adam and Adam's sin. Sin brought the death penalty on mankind. But he also talks about Jesus being the last Adam. Jesus would come and complete what the first Adam failed to do. He also speak, spoke of Adam as the first man being of the earth, and Jesus, the second man, being of the, of the heavenly. So uh, it was important that the one who would provide atonement would be a man, a real man. That's the incarnation. It's also stated in the book of Romans particularly that this man would die for all men. And hopefully we'll talk some about that through this study on redemption. How is it that Jesus being a singular man, how could he die for the sins of many men or all men? And uh, that has to do with not only something uh, to do with the fact that he was a man, but the kind of man that he was. And... Uh, how God, how he offered himself through the eternal spirit. So there's some fascinating subject matter as we dive into the idea of the atonement. And uh, of course, this time of year on the Jewish calendar, we're headed into Rosh Hashanah, the head of the year. And then this, uh, that'll be this coming weekend. Then on Sunday, the 27th, will be the Yom Kippur on Jewish calendar, the day of covering. That's the day of atonement. Uh, of course, Jesus has fulfilled all of that. We're not looking back to get something to help us. We're, we look back to see pictures of Jesus knowing he is the ultimate mm -hmm. deliverer. And so um, that, that's important. So um, Isaiah chapter 53. Let's start as we, as we move toward a study of the atonement. We'll start in Isaiah 53, which is a prophetic picture that Isaiah was given a, a proclamation prophetically that came from Isaiah telling us about the one who would come, who would bear our sins. So let's start in Isaiah 53, verse 4, and we are going to read through verse 6. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Yes, and that last statement there, the Lord the Lord, Yahweh, hath laid on him. That is the suffering servant, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Now we're looking back. We see how all this comes together. The Lord, God the Father, laid on him the iniquity of us all. Your iniquity, my iniquity, all of our iniquity. Who did that? The Lord did. So we begin to see who was working at the cross. Mm -hmm. um, and you, you can take a lot of angles. Had the prince of the world known what he's doing, he would not have crucified the Lord of glory. The scripture mm -hmm. talks about Satan's role in the crucifixion. Mm -hmm. the, the Jewish leaders cried, let his blood be upon our hands, you know, once Pilate washed his hands. So we see their involvement in there. Judas sold him out for 30 pieces of silver. We see his involvement. We see those at the foot of the cross jeering, mocking, scorning, ridiculing, persecuting. We see their role. The scripture is very clear about my role, your role, and those of you who are watching your role that the Lord laid on him our iniquity. So every, every, you see, everybody's got, a, it's like it's, everybody's got their finger in the pie, so to speak. But here Isaiah is showing us the main sweeping thing that's happened at the cross is that the Lord himself was working through Christ to provide the sacrifice 
for mankind for us to be redeemed, reconciled, and restored. God's original Mm -hmm. plan for humanity disrupted by sin. Now, the fact that the Lord was working through this, that does not nullify anyone's responsibility. Not at all. The fact that uh, the the Bible says that God laid on Jesus the iniquity of us all, that doesn't mean, mean that he committed that iniquity. No, he's dealing with the iniquities that had been committed, including all of those aforementioned who played a role. I mean, some might say, well, my goodness, if this was ordained, if God had this laid out, if this was God's plan unfolding, then these people really can't be held responsible. They didn't have a choice, but that's errant thinking. They did have a choice in their context. They chose what they did out of sinful reasons, and the Bible tells us those reasons, you know, Pilate for fear of the Jews, for fear of what Emperor Caesar might do, these Jewish leaders for fear of Jesus, uh, taking their authority, their control, so forth. They're all held responsible and accountable. Mm -hmm. Just like we are for our sins, even though they've been laid on Christ, we still have to answer for them unless we run to Christ. And uh, that is the message of, uh, of the cross that God was at work through Christ. He laid on him the iniquity of us all. And notice notice here as we begin to think about atonement, uh, what you read in Isaiah, Mm -hmm. that he bore our griefs. He carried our Mm -hmm. sorrow. Yet we esteemed him stricken. He was stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. Isn't that amazing? It is. Isaiah said, you know, all this is happening smitten by God and afflicted. But then he goes on to say, he was wounded for our transgressions. Well, it said he was smitten by God, but who wounded him? Well, a Roman soldier had that cat of nine tails when he was scourged. They drove those nails through his hand. Uh, He was bruised for our iniquities. They buffeted him Mm -hmm. with their Mm fists. Chastised for our peace by stripes. Again, the scourging. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of Saul. Again, we see this convergence of the sins of mankind, the actions of mankind, and yet the redemptive hand of God working through this. There's so much majesty uh, that's in this scripture that Isaiah gives us. It's it's just amazing. It and is a beautiful there, prophetic picture. Yes, hundreds of years. Isaiah is... He writes a lot of beautiful scriptures. Yes. <laughs> he was able to tune into the heart of God in a beautiful way. And there's New Testament. Uh, let's look at a couple of New Testament scriptures, too, that we, relates to the fact that God was at work in this as well. Okay. We didn't mention Leviticus 16. Did you want to? Yeah, the, the Yom Kippur, the day of, were... uh, of covering. We'll, uh, let's okay. come back right. to that in a little bit. And... So let's look at 2 Corinthians 4. 521 where it says for he made him that is Jesus who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him so God made Jesus who had abs- knew absolutely no sin to become sin for us so that we could have his righteousness we might become the righteousness of God and that's a yeah. uh, humbling and powerful thought. And, and again, we see the redemptive hand of God, for he made him mm-hmm. to become sin for us. And literally, uh, the the depth that this verse takes us is very uncomfortable mm-hmm. because it's basically in Jesus became sin, something he had never experienced of his own volition. But out of his own volition, he allowed our sins to be heaped upon him and took them into himself and became that. Uh, and that is, uh, and, and this gets into the whole, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You know, the whole idea of a, a holy father having to, to turn away from why? the son. And, uh, but Jesus became sin for us. This is the exchange. He became sin for us. He knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Again, now we begin to see that he was acting. Uh, God was very much active in this process that Jesus was going through. He made him to be sin. He laid on him the iniquity of us all. Mm -hmm. 
Jesus very much is the sacrifice. He, no man takes my life from me. I lay it down, you know. He could have been rescued. He could have called upon those legions and they would have rescued him. But he, he, nobody took his life. He surrendered his life. He yielded his life to this plan of God. He received those sins placed upon him. And the, I believe that was the most treacherous part of the cross for him. And to, to see that breach of fellowship, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's painful for him. Yes. So Paul here describes describes it for us. And then in John ten seventeen, Jesus, listen to what Jesus said. Therefore, my father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my Father. And again, this this acknowledgement, God was going to be working. Jesus would willingly submit himself to it. God would be working through that and God would raise him up again. And uh, Jesus, what he went through, uh, to fulfill the, the, I come to do thy will, O Lord. The, his obedient heart to Father's plan, his tremendous love for Father and his tremendous love for us, that he laid down his life for us. In a sense, those who nailed him there, he died for them. Those who scourged him there, his blood was shed for them just the same. And that's a remarkable thing. We can look at Genesis three fifteen to get more insight into yeah. God's plan. Go back plan. even farther. Go back to the beginning um, where God said, I will put enmity between you and the woman as he's pronouncing this upon the serpent. And between your seed and her seed, he shall bruise your head, but you shall bruise his Crush, yeah. heel. Crush his heel. Yeah, crush his head, yeah. Crush his head. Yeah, yeah. All right. So... Here's this picture right back from the beginning where God is uh, laying out a picture mm-hmm. of atonement. Yes, yes. And this, again, we've talked about that before. The, what it means to the woman that's here in this, that even though she, she's just now failed God, he's prophesying, mm-hmm. I'm going to work through a woman. Mm-hmm. It's going to bring a redeemer and telling the serpent, you may have hoodwinked this man and woman. But through this woman, there's going to come one. Uh, you'll bruise his heel. Referencing the crucifixion. In other words, the serpent would be involved in Jesus being crucified. God was involved, yes, but the serpent, Satan, was involved too. You will bruise his heel. So again, you're seeing the, uh, it's real life stuff to to, to describe it, the characters of this drama that unfolds. Mm -hmm. The serpent would bruise his heel, but he will crush your head. Jesus Radical obedience, his um, absolute commitment to, you know, and the night before, he knew what was coming. The night before he sweated, as it were, great drops of blood in Gethsemane, and he crushed Satan's head. He came to destroy the works of the devil. And that's the grinding heel of the Messiah on Satan's head as he died mm-hmm. on the cross. And the enemy had no idea that he was being involved in putting <laughs> Jesus on the cross, which would sign his defeat, signal his defeat. He was very caught up in his hatred and yes. uh, murderous spirit. To me, mm-hmm. didn't see what God was doing. Yeah, that was his check move on God, and the cross was... God's checkmate That's right. on Satan to end it. So, wow. Um, John 12, 27, Jesus said, Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Notice that. But for this purpose I came. He's getting closer to the cross. And I'm going to need to unplug this large microphone because it says my my phone is being hot. That may change your ability to hear us a little bit, so I apologize for that. But I'll go back to this. When Jesus said, Father, you know, glorify your name, then it says, this is another occasion when God spoke from heaven audibly. Then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. 
Therefore, the people who stood by and heard it said it had thundered. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Then Jesus answered and said, This voice did not come because of me, but for your sake. Now is the judgment of the world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. This he said, signifying by what death he would die. Again, this is a passage where a lot's going on. Mm -hmm. You know, Father, glorify your name. Father, I said, I, I have and I will. So mm -hmm. God the Father said, yes, I'm going to be working. I'm gonna, you're going to be glorified through what you do. The people's here in this. And he said, uh, the prince of the world's about to be judged. And... Uh, and I'll, if I'm lifting up, I'll draw all men to me. There's the redemption. You know, the judgment of Satan, the, the dealing with the death penalty that sin has on us would result in us being drawn to him and finding our way out, our redemption, to be reconciled to God. And so the cross is ground zero for Christianity. What happened there sets it apart from every other religious system, um, the blood of Jesus shed for our sins. So we are going to be talking in particular about the atonement and one of the ideas we wanted to talk about was how the atonement is vicarious, the vicarious yes. atonement. And so when we use that word vicarious, we're talking about how one person takes the place of another person yeah. or thing. So it's acts and like serving as a substitute. So when Jesus atones for our sin, atoned for our sins. He was taking our place. He was our substitute. To be able to experience an event, um, an action through the action of someone else. And I tell, I'm, you know, and I, you've heard me talk about this before just in reference to my boys. You know, I, I used to love to hunt and fish. and I'll still go sometimes, but I mean, I used to just, I needed to get out there and do it. But now I really enjoy doing it through my sons. They're out there. They're doing it. So I want to know, well, tell me, where were you hunting? Did you see anything? You know, how was the weather? And tell me, about, oh, you got one. Tell me all the details. You know, I am experiencing that event through them. Now, that's a, a faint, faint glimmer of an illustration of what we're talking about when Jesus vicariously died for his vicarious suffering, his vicarious atonement that the Bible teaches us that when he died there, I died there. When he died there, you died there. He died in our place just as if we were doing the dying. He did it for us. In other words, there's a, there is something that happened on the cross that Christ went through that we get the full benefit and involvement of that. The Bible, we've already seen that Isaiah said that God would lay our iniquity upon him. And so uh, Hebrews 2, verse 9, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. When he died, we all died. Uh, in, in that sense. And again, this, now this is getting into the point of how could one die for many? Uh, you know, you'd think it'd be a one on one. You know, okay, I've sinned, so uh, if I can't die for my sin, then someone else would be executed in my mm -hmm. place. But yet, Jesus' death was sufficient to supply the redemption for all mankind. And the thing that satisfies me about this is, is you begin to see the absolute splendor, the depth, the perfection, the majesty, and the glory of Christ himself. And that going back to that Hebrews passage we studied several times, how he in the eternal spirit offered himself to God. He was the one supreme sinless life, the only one that's ever lived in all humanity that went the distance. And when it came time, he did not have to taste death for himself. He had never sinned. The wages of sin is death. But when it came time, he chose to take our sins upon himself and offered his sinless life vicariously in our place. He died. And that's the beauty of, of what we're talking about. 
when we're talking about vicarious atonement. And, and there's other New Testament writers that speak yeah, to that. Peter speaks to that, 1 Peter 3, 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. So this uh, we see that idea that he suffered one time for sins, the just, him being just, for everyone who was unjust, that he might bring us all to God if we would come. That is so pivotal there that by one offering, Hebrews says, he's perfected forever those who are sanctified. By one offering, and as Mickey just read, he suffered once for sins. This is the finality, the permanence, the supremacy of his sacrifice we talked about last week. Again, we see it here as we're studying uh, this theme of the cross, the atoning, the atonement that was procured at Calvary. And uh, so... Uh, again, this is very, very uh, important for once. The Old Testament system, as we saw, we've seen this several times, this, the priest had to offer them continuously. Now, going back to that idea of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, the Day of Covering, very interestingly, New Testament writers really don't employ the idea of the covering of sin, that particular covering. They'll reach back and point at some Old Testament things. The, the, the Old Testament... Covering in Romans chapter 3, uh, I don't know if I have that here, but we'll get to it later, where Paul talks about uh, that, that Jesus removes the sin. Mm -hmm. And the Old Testament in times past, okay, let me read this, Romans 3.25. Whom, speaking of Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously previously committed to demonstrate to the present time his righteousness that he might be both just and the justifier of the one who uh, has faith in Christ. And we'll get back into that when we talk about propitiation. Mm -hmm. But here what I want you to see is in the Old Testament, that sin, God in his forbearance would allow that the blood of bulls and goats to block, be a temporary covering. He's showing them that without the shedding of blood, there's no, there's no remission of sin. So it's like, he would look over it. He would cover it. It was we would use the term like sweep it under the rug. It's not really dealt with, you know. Like anything we see sweep under the rug, it's still there, right? We use it in a negative term, like we don't want to deal with it. We just sweep it under the rug. Well, it's still there. Well, there's in a sense the Old Testament system. The blood would temporarily cover, and it's like God would, in His forbearance, would overlook those sins. But He wasn't doing anything unjust because. He, had, he was also prophesying, and all this was pointing to a time mm -hmm. when one would come that would not only uh, die and, and shed blood for others, but would deal with finality with the sin issue of man. For by one, uh, one offering he has perfected forever those that are sanctified. As you, that he offered himself once, the just for the unjust, to bring us to God. Again, it's showing the high, lofty superiority and supremacy of the sacrifice of Christ over anything under that Old Testament system. And that God's justice would be served. That was a message. God's, God's justice mm -hmm. is demanded for sin committed, but it was forbearance that allowed that blood system of the Old Testament to be in place until the Lamb of God would come who was slain from the foundation of the world. And again, we, we get a window into the meaning of that. In the very beginning, God knew a lamb would be slain to take care of. Uh, so the lambs, if you will, the, the blood of lambs, goats, bulls in the Old Testament was pointing to the blood of the Lamb of God, the Christ, the Son of God who would come that would be shed, that would do away uh, with the sin penalty. And so to me, it's just beautiful to realize the, the majesty of God's plan unfolding in this. And yes. those Old Testament pictures beautifully point us to Christ. And as we talked about last week, uh, those are shadows. Now, Christ is the substance. You know, those were temporary. Christ, his is permanent. And so he is now forever a higher priest. We don't need to go to a priest anymore. We don't need the blood of bulls of goats sacrificed anymore. As a matter of fact, that's a travesty uh, on this side of the cross because that sacrifice has been offered. That's right. The one offering's been offered. Some and, other uh, yes. New Testament writers point to this truth as well. Paul writing in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, 
said, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So this is the same idea. First mm-hmm. uh, Timothy 2, 5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all mm-hmm. to be testified in due time. And Jesus used that same terminology in Matthew 20, Mm -hmm. uh, verse 28. He said he came to give his life a ransom for for many. Mm -hmm. And so it's um, it's just beautiful when when you realize exactly his was a vicarious death. And the word that we probably use that's more common is just the idea of a substitute. Right. And not a substitute sometimes means like second best. Like when we were, when I was playing football, when you were a sub, you didn't go in unless somebody better than you had to come out, right? You right. know, that's, that's the idea of a substitute. But not so when we apply it to the atonement. The substitute there means there's nobody, you know, we all had to die for our own sins. It ultimately means eternal separation from God forever and ever and ever and ever. Mm-hmm. So Jesus comes on the scene uh, not as a substitute that's less than we are, but greater than we are, who had never sinned. And in our place, he dies. In our place, he he dies, he, he, he takes the judgment and wrath of sin. We'll get into that tomorrow, or the day after tomorrow. We're talking about the vicarious nature, his substitutionary nature of his atonement. Theologians would call it the uh, penal substitution uh, the penal substitutionary atonement. Penal, in the sense there was something legal, and the justice, judgment was served upon Christ instead of upon us. He did it in our place. It's like, okay, I take my sandals off, and they represent my life, and he steps into those sandals and does for me what I could have never done for myself. That's a good way to put it. So back to the Isaiah scripture. All we like, and this is Isaiah 53, 6, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Yes, and that'll be a good place to stop it for today because the idea of the Lord laying on him the iniquity of us all. Now we're getting to, to some other pictures uh, in the Old Testament on the day of Palma, the one, then where there's a bull offered and two goats, and one of those goats would be shed, and the other one, the priest would lay hands on that goat symbolizing putting the sins and they'd be led outside. We'll talk about that tomorrow. That's going to be interesting. When we talk about the uh, uh, ex, 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 expiation of Christ, the expiatory, the ex, uh, expiatory, uh, sub, uh, expiatory atonement. Mm-hmm. Again, there's some big theological terms and we use those just so when you run across those, you'll have an idea of, of what they mean and uh, they're full with me. Terms mean something, and that's the reason we use these words. Not that you're going to go on the street necessarily and use those terms, but as a child of God, to know what that means, Mm -hmm. to know what the cross means, what he did for you there. And today we see that he was our substitute. He died vicariously in our place to do for us. We can praise him for that. What What a blessing. Yeah. We'll be back here tomorrow morning at 1030 to talk more about the atonement. I hope you'll be back with us. If you enjoyed today, you can take just a minute and hit the share button and share this with some of your friends, and uh, maybe they can pick up and watch some of the series with us as well. So yes, for and, I, and I do want to apologize, and we're way behind on getting these posted to gracehouse.tv. I'm having trouble um, getting the downloads from my Facebook through the app uh, in a form that I can upload them to YouTube, and it's... Uh, been long, tried to work on that this morning, but it's been a little frustrating. So it's just a very time-consuming process, and I'm behind, and I do apologize for that. But you can see it here on Facebook. Yes, yes. So thanks a lot for being with us. See you tomorrow at 1030 a.m. Bless you. Love you all.